This episode is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of another sale on Shopify. The moment a business dream becomes reality. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. They simplify selling online and in person and provide 24-7 support so you can focus on successfully growing your business. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash offer 22, all lowercase. Welcome to GabFest Reads for the month of March. I'm John Dickerson, one of the hosts of Slate's Political GabFest. This episode, I spoke with Chris Miller, the author of Chip War, The Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. It's a book about the history of the semiconductor, the wondrous process of how they are made, and it's a book that gave me a totally new view of global politics and economics. Oh, it's so wonderful. Chris, I'm, there's so much to do. Um, you know, like a good student, I have lots of, uh, lots of uh, notes. <laughs> What to you is the best exp- uh, description of what a semiconductor does? I mean, so people will say it's ones and zeros. Like, what is it at its ba- most basic that we can then just imagine, okay, multiply that by 15 million? Yeah, it's, it's just a circuit turning on and off. It's like a light switch. Uh, and when it's on, you get the one. When it's off, you get the zero. And it's just lots of light switches, except rather than being the size of your finger flipping them up and down, they're measured in billionths of a meter. And silicon was, as I recall from reading this, and you'll correct me, was um, important because it could be both a conduit and opaque. It could have different properties. That's right, yeah. Semiconductor refers not only to the devices uh, inside of our phones, but also to a class of materials. So most materials are either a conductor like copper wire or an insulator like glass. And semiconductors can conduct when you apply an electric field on top of them. And so the way the devices work inside chips is they apply an electric field, a current is opened, the switch is turned on, uh, and that's how you get the circuits flowing that produce the ones and the zeros. And we'll hop around here. One of the things I love just from the very start is um, you open up the book and of course there's a glossary that's helpful for people like me. But what I love was you start with a cast of characters. What's great about this is this is a book that is obviously rich with um, economic theory, world history, understanding. There's a fantastic series of sections on how semiconductors work and uh, EUV works, and we'll get to all of that, but it's it's a story. And so you have these cast of characters which which propel it as a story. Um, and I don't want to give it away the way it starts because that's quite effective, though we'll get into that topic later. But tell me as a place to start, Chris, is there a way to tell the story? I know you do it in the whole book, but of chips and how semiconductors have become so central by the time you finish reading this book. I just see them everywhere now and think of them as this crucial central part of our life. Is there a way to shorten that story? Well, there's there's one individual whose life really maps onto the chip industry, and that's Morris Chang. Uh, who founded the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, which today produces 90% of the world's most advanced processor chips, the chips in our phones and our PCs and the data centers, a company whose products that uh, none of us can live without, but that we are barely uh, barely aware of. And, and Morris Chang uh, was present at the creation of the chip industry uh, at Texas Instruments in the late 1950s. And uh, today he is still deeply involved in chip making in Taiwan, producing the types of chips that are, uh, for example, driving forward progress in artificial intelligence. And so his, his life has in some ways been uh, the life of, of the chip industry as well. And I want to get back to him because he seems to be kind of the one person who is able to ride the changes and 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 now is in this position of extraordinary dominance. But before we get there, was there for you when you started this project, were there a set of questions? Was there a single question that you were in search of, that you were hunting to figure out through this project? I think there were, there were three puzzles that, that I started with. One was that was why is it so hard to make semiconductors? <laughs> they, they they didn't seem like they should be something that was so impossible to make, and yet just a tiny number of companies dominated their production. And so that was a, a puzzle. The, the second was, why is it that China spends as much money each year importing chips as it spends importing oil? 
which is an extraordinary fact that I had no idea of when I began this research, but really seems to kind of redraw the map of what globalization looks like. And and the third is what explains the rise of technology uh, across all aspects of society and economy. And, and I guess I started with the hunch that we'd spent the last couple of decades talking a lot about social media and search engines, but had underrated the importance of the computing hardware that makes all of the big tech, the big tech firms possible. And so those were the, the three interrelated questions that led me towards semiconductors and, and convinced me that they were actually sort of the hidden puzzle piece that explains uh, so much of the modern world. Why did Silicon Valley and America become the place where so much of the early work on on this was done, where there were great innovations and Moore's Law, um, which is a which is almost a character in your book itself, comes out of the uh, uh, of the American chip industry? What was a part of that original beginnings and that made it so successful in America? Well, it was really a, a two step process. The first step was actually uh, came from the government and the Pentagon, which was the biggest buyer of uh, chips in the late 1950s and early 1960s at the start of the industry. And the Pentagon wanted chips to provide miniaturized computing power in the nose cone of missiles to guide them more accurately. And so the chip industry wouldn't have existed if it had not been for procurement from uh, the Defense Department and from NASA. But then the, the next step was taking these very expensive um, devices that were used in small production runs for military systems and making them an object of mass production. And that's what Silicon Valley did especially well. It was turning these devices into something that was embedded into almost everything, not just computers, but eventually calculators and phones and today dishwashers and automobiles too. And and, and that was what the companies that came to define Silicon Valley, companies like Intel, uh, did particularly well, take this high-tech product and make it ubiquitous. And that's one of the things you say early in the book, which, which was really striking and a nice framing device, which is it's not just the engineers and the brilliant people putting ever more transistors in ever smaller spaces, but it's in some cases, it's a question. It's a it's manufacturing genius, and then later when you talk about um, all that goes into um, creating EUV chips, like the complexity of um, you know how uh, ASML um, makes these high you know cutting edge chips, like it's mind blowing. And I want to I want to get there, but but explain a little bit that idea that it there are geniuses in this story that you tell that are not always just um you know the what we would think of as engineers but there are these other kinds of skills that have been a part of the rise of this industry yeah i, I came away thinking that our 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 way of uh of conceptualizing scientific advances and technological advances put too much emphasis on scientists certainly nobel winners are important but the, the pathway from a new invention to a device that changes society is a pathway that requires mass manufacturing with extraordinary efficiency. It requires driving down the price so you can put it in everything. Uh, and it requires visionary thinking about products. And, and one of the things that really struck me is that none of the physicists who invented the semiconductors had any idea that these ships would be in cars or in smartphones or in data centers. And it, it took a whole different set of people to have that vision of what are the new products that this type of technology can enable. It seems that this is also, it's a story of making two two things struck me, big bets, big gambles on, you know, do we go down the the memory chip road, or do we go down making uh, CPUs or, you know, um, do we create generic CPUs or do we create bespoke ones for certain kinds of activities? EUV, uh, which I keep mentioning and people will just have to wait um, till Chris explains exactly what that is, but believe me, it's worth it. We required this huge bet. What to you are some of the big bets? And then I should say, well, the other thing that strikes me is there are also some huge mistakes, you know, or, or people fall off the map who were once considered to be, you know, the, the, the winners of this uh, lottery for life, but start first with some of the big bets. And am I right about that, that we're talking about just enormous gambles at certain periods in this story? 
Yeah, that, that's right. And, and today, an advanced chip making facility can cost $20 billion. So if you're going to open up a new facility, uh, that, that is indeed a, a massive bet. These are actually the most expensive factories ever made in human history. So the, the scale of the gambling is, is quite large. I think there were a couple of key turning points in the industry. One was betting that you could take technology that was designed for missile systems and put it in consumer devices. And that was far from obvious to most people. Um, and, and indeed, a lot of the industry was perfectly happy trying to make a decent living on Pentagon procurement contracts rather than gambling uh, that you could actually find civilian users. So that, that was the first one. The second big bet was on creating international supply chains. And I was surprised to find uh, in this industry that the process of offshoring assembly to East Asia began in the early 1960s. It was basically present from the beginning of the industry, uh, and it, it cr produced enormous efficiencies uh, that we can talk about and also some interesting vulnerabilities that uh, define the industry today. And I think that the third big bet was the bet on concentration. In, in the early days of the industry, there were a number of different firms that could produce cutting-edge chips of different types, whereas today, uh, there's been extraordinary concentration such that for many types of chips, there's just one or two companies that can make them. They make them in vast facilities uh, with enormous capital expenditure involved. And that concentration has proven very, very efficient. Uh, but the process of creating these vast companies uh, was a, a big gamble and it would have been a very costly one had it gone wrong. Why was the move to East Asia in the 1960s? What, what encouraged that? In the chip making process, the, the actual manufacturing of semiconductors is very capital intensive. You need a lot of machines to do it. But then after you've got a chip, you put it in a package. And that process has always been quite labor intensive. And so in the earliest days of the industry, there were efforts to scour the United States to find sufficiently low-wage labor. Uh, some early chip companies opened uh, assembly facilities on Indian reservations, for example, trying to find ultra-low-priced wages. But nothing could compare it to Hong Kong, which was the first place that uh, Silicon Valley firms opened offshore assembly. And that dynamic has stayed present up to, the, up to today, where there still is... Um, most uh, uh, most assembly of chips into their packages happens in East Asia and China and Southeast Asia. Remind people what Moore's Law is, and it feels like one short way to tell this story is essentially everybody involved in the chip making business trying to keep up with or fulfill the promise of Moore's Law, uh, and that that's led to all of these, you know, the, the offshoring, the the innovation, the, the fact that we're in this concentrated position we're in today. Remind us what Moore's Law is. So Gordon Moore was uh, an early uh, engineer in the chip industry. He would later go on to co-found Intel. And he noticed in 1965 that the number of components uh, on each chip was doubling every year or so. And that meant that chips were getting uh, twice as powerful every year or two. And that dynamic has, uh, has been maintained up to the present. Uh, for the past several decades, every two years, chips have gotten twice as powerful. And what that means is that the chip industry has improved vastly more rapidly than any other part of the economy. And I, I like to think about, you know, what, what's an analogy in other sectors of the economy? What if airplanes flew twice as fast every two years and that, that rate of change was, uh, was, was steady for the past century? It's, it's sort of impossible to imagine, but it, that's why... Um, remembering uh, uh, data on semiconductor devices costs less than a millionth of what it did 50 years ago because that, of that exponential growth rate. I always assumed that the idea was you always went to cutting edge chips and that there was no use for anything that wasn't right at the cutting edge. And so I was interested to learn about the different kinds of chips that are useful and various different kinds of things. But essentially keeping up with Moore's law means trying to fit more stuff in a smaller space, more powerful stuff in a smaller space, which requires extraordinary feats of design. And I mean, the, 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 I, it was hard to conceive sometimes about how small the, the etchings you were talking about were. If you go to a, an, an Apple store today and buy a new iPhone, the, the primary chip on that iPhone will have 15 billion tiny transistors carved into it. And so to fit 15 billion devices on a chip the size of your fingernail, each one of them is the size of a virus. And they're produced with basically perfect accuracy. I believe, I love, I think it was the um, ASML machine you said that could hit 
a golf ball and hit the moon? What was the the accuracy you, I, I'm butchering it maybe, but the sense of accuracy of one of their lasers was what? That's right. They could they could hit a golf ball sitting on the moon, firing that laser from Earth. Oh my God. All right. So the, this notion of c- concentration, which will get us, why has the industry become so concentrated? There are two main reasons. It, the first is that if you produce more chips, you can gain economies of scale. Costs get lower because you're able to buy machinery more efficiently, acquire materials more efficiently. So it, the cost is part of it. But the second is the more chips you produce, the more you can hone your production processes and advance your technology. And so today, it's it's not a coincidence that TSMC, the Taiwanese company we mentioned, is both the world's largest chip maker and the world's most advanced chip maker because they get data from every chip they produce and then use that to produce the next chip more efficiently. Support for this podcast comes from WISE, the universal account that lets you send, spend, and receive money internationally. With one account for over 50 currencies, who exactly is WISE made for? It's made for jet setters and slow travelers, for seeing old friends in new places. WISE is made for business in the city and pleasure on the coast, for studying abroad and supporting your little brother's schooling back home. WISE is made for people without borders, who want to live truly global lives with ease. You see, with WISE, you always get the mid-market exchange rate whenever you convert or spend different currencies. There are no markups and no hidden fees. That's pounds to pesos, dollars to dong, just like that. Helping you save on currency conversion wherever your money takes you. WISE, it's the account that's made for the world. Join 13 million customers and learn how the WISE account could work for you at WISE.com slash GabFest. I want to tell you about another podcast that I think you should be listening to. We are living through a wild moment in American history. Conspiracy theorists on House committees, extremists on the Supreme Court, near fistfights on C-SPAN. But history is not finished, and we can change its course for the better by staying informed and taking action, big or small. Crooked Media's Pod Save America is hosted by four former Obama aides, John Favreau, John Lovett, Dan Pfeiffer, and Tommy Veter. They worked in government and now use their expertise to provide listeners with a no-bullshit guide to democracy. Every week, they break down all the political news that makes us laugh, cry, and scream into the void to help us figure out what matters and what each of us can do about it. They take you behind the scenes as they talk to politicians, activists, artists, and journalists. And they have a lot of fun while they're doing it. Pod Save America is news with action items. They give you the tools you need so you can do your part and stay in the fight. Find Pod Save America wherever you get your podcasts. Love It or Leave It is a lively variety show recorded live on stage and delivered to your ears every week. Each episode, host John Lovett is joined by an all-star lineup of comedians, journalists, and experts to break down the week's most absurd headlines in politics and pop culture. Come for the games, rants, and performances. Stay for the unplanned tirades on local fast food options. Find Love It or Leave It wherever you get your podcasts. And Chris, I want to turn us towards uh, the sort of global politics right now and the current position before I lose you. But I want to think about U.S. semiconductor policy here now to kind of bring us up to the present. It seems like the Biden administration um, and national security as it thinks about chips has kind of two prongs to it. Um, And maybe they're related, maybe they're not. One is recognizing there are vulnerabilities and shortages in this amazingly important um, thing in the world and trying to shore up those shortages. So that's one part. And then the other is trying to basically deprive China of its chip making capacity. Let's take the first one first. How do you assess both America's vulnerability with this concentration you're talking about, um, the fact that TSMC is in Taiwan. Um, how vulnerable is the U.S. Uh, dependence on chips in the world right now? So the whole world is critically dependent on Taiwan for advanced semiconductors. Smartphones, PCs, data centers, cell phone towers, the entire tech infrastructure is basically impossible to build without chips from Taiwan. And 
if there were a war in Taiwan or a blockade that prevented Taiwan from exporting chips, the impact on global manufacturing, U.S., Europe, China, Japan, would be catastrophic. It would be Great Depression scale in terms of its impact, uh, not only in our production of, of things that we think of as having chips inside, but also of dishwashers and cars and coffee makers. And every device with an on-off switch has a semiconductor inside, unless it's the most simple of light bulbs. And a big chunk of those chips are made in Taiwan. So we're, we're all critically vulnerable. And as the risk of war in Taiwan has grown, uh, I think people have become more and more concerned that uh, we're far from prepared to deal with that. So that that's that's the real supply chain challenge. The past couple of years, we've obviously had some pandemic-induced supply chain issues. They're now mostly resolved. The real problem is if something goes wrong in the Taiwan Straits, uh, we're going to face an economic catastrophe. All, all eggs are in one basket. So what... But the Biden administration is trying to increase domestic production, um, and, and I think is this right? TSMC has got a plant. Is it TSMC is opening a plant in Arizona or something? Um, what I guess what I get. What is the Biden? What is the administration trying to do? And is it nibbling at the edges of the condition you just described, or is there a, a real effort here to build some sustainability or self sufficiency that could withstand something going sideways in Taiwan? Yeah, you know, I, I think self-sufficiency is not the right frame to think of it because we're still going to be buying materials and machines from the Netherlands and Japan far into the future. So n no country can produce advanced ships on its own. But I think the, the Biden administration and Congress, and this has been a bipartisan issue in Congress, has been trying to reduce reliance on Taiwan precisely to deal with, with this scenario. And and the CHIPS Act, which is going to spend around $40 billion in incentivizing more manufacturing in the U.S., is, is going to have some effect. But I think the key question is, when we look at the big buyers of semiconductors, companies like Apple, AMD, NVIDIA, uh, they're the companies that determine where TSMC build its facilities because they're TSMC's biggest customers. And right now, they seem pretty comfortable buying their critical chips from Taiwan. And unless they change, and maybe they will, but unless they change their plans, uh, the world's most expensive uh, uh, chips and the world's highest volume chips will continue to be produced in Taiwan. So does this mean that Taiwan is both protected by, I think it's what's it called a silicon shield. In other words, so vital, no one can mess with them. Or does it mean China, which is, you know, it could get feeling very acquisitive and say, well, we would like all of this to be in charge of all of this. How does it, how do you read that? So I, th I think the Chinese leadership knows that if they were to attack, Taiwan's ship industry would be destroyed. It'd be destroyed because the war would probably... Uh, disable the facilities because these plants need regular imports of materials and spare parts from Japan, the U.S. and the Netherlands because you shouldn't assume that the personnel in the plants would stick around under a Chinese occupation regime. So I think it's, it's highly unlikely that China could grab Taiwan and inherit functioning plants. But that doesn't mean that I'm all that confident China is going to be deterred by the economic cost of attacking um, because the reality is that History provides numerous examples of countries that have gone to war at disastrous economic cost for themselves and their adversaries. And I've got to um, sense over your uh, right shoulder is a book on Stalin and uh, the history of the Soviet. I've got to get your I mean, when you say that, I ob obviously you, Russia and Ukraine comes to mind. Do you think that China, with respect to Taiwan, watches how the West has responded to the invasion of Ukraine and um, and taken a lesson one way or the other about meddling with this place. Because once you read your book and are kind of focused on the centrality of Taiwan with, with chips, it's very hard for me to kind of not think about Taiwan all the time. So what lessons do you think China, if any, is, is getting from what's happening in Ukraine? It's a hard question to have a confident answer to. I, I, I think that the Chinese leadership is is undoubtedly more skeptical of their military capabilities than they were a year ago, just because Russia's military capabilities have so dramatically underperformed everyone's expectations. So that's that's a positive if China feels less confident and its military is less likely to attack. But then I, I also look at the fact that the war has been going on for a year and Russia is still in the war. It still controls territory on net, and it probably will continue controlling more territory than it started fighting with. 
I think that's a lesson that's much less optimistic uh, from our perspective. And a, a third lesson that I worry that China has concluded is that nuclear threats work. And from the beginning, Putin has threatened nuclear war. And from the beginning, Biden has understandably in some ways said, we're not going to intervene because we're afraid of nuclear war. And if you were to envision ramifications of that for a future Taiwan scenario, I think on day one of any sort of conflict between China and Taiwan, China would issue very dangerous nuclear threats, and it would be tough for the U.S. to respond. Yeah, effective saber, saber rattling. So there's the threat of, of taking what Taiwan has gotten, but um, I was talking to uh, Kevin Rudd, the former prime minister of Australia, and he had your view too, which was basically, you can't just go in and take over what, what they do in Taiwan. They would um, you, it's not, you know, you can't just turn on the lights and, and press a button. Um, what about China has been on a march, um, I guess since 2015 to try to create its own domestic chip, correct me where I'm wrong here, production cap capacity capability. How's it going? Um, and how close is China to catching up to where they would want to be to have more independence from this incredibly interdependent, um, system that you've described? So I think China's progress has been mixed over the past decade. On the one hand, there's a lot of different spheres in which China has substantially more capabilities than it did a decade ago in terms of chip manufacturing, in terms of chip design. But it's also the case that China's industry remains really critically reliant on imported software tools and especially imported machine tools. So the most advanced chip making facilities in China are reliant on the exact same companies to import tools from ASML in the Netherlands, a number of US firms, a couple of Japanese firms, just like TSMC. And so you can't make an advanced chip in China without using machine tools that are imported from the US or a couple of allies. And that's given the US a lot of ability to cut off Chinese firms from advancing or at least making it very, very difficult, very costly to, uh, to make advances. And so Chinese firms not only find themselves still a couple generations behind what TSMC can do, and a couple generations means a couple more laws behind, um, but they, they also find it increasingly difficult to make progress because the US isn't letting them get the machines that are needed uh, to produce even more advanced chips. And how do you evaluate what the Biden administration has done just on that on that last point you made in terms of choking the um, ability of China to to meet its ambitions in creating chips? I think the Biden administration's rules have made it a lot more difficult um, because Chinese firms were relying on U.S. providers of machines to make their chips. And uh, as of last October, when the Biden administration tightened the rules, uh, now there's a whole suite of cutting edge machines that uh, Chinese firms simply can't import, not only from the U.S., but also there's been a, a deal between the U.S., Japan and the Netherlands to cut off chip making machines from all three of those countries. Let's finally talk about um ASML, you, so that's in the Netherlands. Explain EUV and what and why what uh, ASML does is so important, and why the Biden administration would want to, you know, get in the way of letting that get to China. That technology. So the way you produce a chip with 15 billion tiny transistors carved into it, each one the size of a virus, is by a process called lithography, which means shooting light through a mask that has the pattern you want to project onto the chip. And the light goes through the mask and reacts with chemicals on the silicon. Uh, and where light hits the chemicals, they react in a certain way. Where light doesn't hit, you don't get that re reaction. And that'll start creating the patterns on, um, on the chip that will eventually produce the 15 billion transistors your iPhone requires. And, and so this process of shooting light is called lithography. And in the early days of the industry, we used visible light for lithography, but visible light has a wavelength of several hundred nanometers, which is now far, far too large for the manufacturing we need. And so today, the most advanced tools have extreme ultraviolet light, which is a type of light close to an x-ray in um, in its uh, uh, in its wavelength, so they the the specific wavelength is thirteen point five nanometers, and so they, they the challenge is to produce light with this exact wavelength uh, at sufficient volumes to manufacture chips. And so the way you do it is you have a ball of tin, thirty millionths of a meter wide, falling through a vacuum. You pulverize it twice with one of the most powerful lasers ever deployed in a commercial device. It explodes into a plasma, measuring forty times hotter than the surface of the sun. The plasma emits this light, which is then collected by the flattest mirrors humans have ever made uh, and directed towards the chip. Uh, 
And so this is uh, hard to do. <laughs> costs, uh, costs $150 million per machine. Uh, and today, the production of these machines is monopolized by just a single company. And what you described so well is the complexity of the machine, the fact that it has to be staffed by people around who know about that complexity and all the parts, preparing for breakdown, depending on how long it's been running, and that it's really a supply chain talent and task. I mean, what you just described is an amazing, wondrous kind of um, almost um, supernatural uh, event, but it requires like those mirrors, for example. I mean, it requires understanding how to get all of the component parts. I think, is it true that you, I think you wrote that this is basically the most complex uh, factory or manufacturing process on the planet? Yeah, that, that's right. There are hundreds of thousands of components uh, in each of these systems. The only thing that really comes close is is a, a large aircraft in terms of the number of components. Like a 747 will have a, a roughly comparable number of components. But the the margin for error in EUV systems is even smaller than the margin of error in uh, in aircraft. We're talking about nanometer levels of, of precision. Um, and one of the things that really struck me in, in learning about these systems was that if you've got a machine with several hundred thousand components, each of those components can basically never break. Because if, you're, if your average time to failure is, is one year per component, your machine never works. Right, right. And debugging must be a hell of a challenge. Um, when I read about the threat from, from China or what worries people and the reason that the Biden administration is blocking this technology and doing everything it can, is um, artificial intelligence is often brought up as the great what do people mean when they say that? That if China has the computing power it needs, it can use it in artificial intelligence, what will it then do? Or what's the fear? To train an AI system, whether it's training ChatGPT to recognize patterns in text across the internet or training a computer vision algorithm to differentiate between a cat and a dog, you've got to show it a ton of data, um, a massive amount of data. And, and to do this efficiently, or to do it at all really, requires uh, advanced chips that can actually crunch all the data. Uh, and so there's really only a small number of data centers in the world, um, hundreds of data centers, but not more than that, that are big enough to train advanced AI systems. And all of them have just a small number of chips inside, almost all at the cutting edge produced by just a couple of companies. Uh, and that's because training AI is so data, data intensive. And so when the US government looks at AI in the future, there's obviously a, uh, any number of civilian applications, but there's also a lot of military and intelligence applications too. Uh, and just as we're learning to train cars to drive more effectively in autonomous mode, we're also learning to train drones to fly more effectively autonomously. And, and defense ministries around the world are increasingly thinking about how do you apply autonomy to military systems. A couple of questions about the writing process. How long did this uh, book, how long did it take? I started the research around 2015. Uh, I, I started with no semiconductor expertise, so it took a long time to uh, get up to speed with uh, with the technology, with the structure of the industry. I, I probably started writing in earnest in, in 2020, so only a couple of years to write, but a long time to research. Yeah. Um, and when you were neck deep in the cave of writing and researching, did you start to have a semiconductor view of the world? I mean, so, you know, if you're writing... Um, uh, I don't know if you're writing about war, you see everything as conflict. If you're, was it in the writing process, it can sometimes shape the brain. Was there, did you have any of that while you were writing about seeing semiconductors just in everything? Well, I, I, I did, but I, I came to realize that that's actually how we should see the world because semiconductors are in everything. And I found myself walking around my house from the moment I woke up and realizing that everything I touched had chips inside. Yeah. And what innovation did Apple make? Because I think people, Intel and PCs and that sort of lane of the story, but briefly describe the, the the smart move that Apple made and where it fits in this vulnerability and concentration of the chip uh, manufacturing world today. So Steve Jobs had a, uh, a great quote from the 1980s before he was really famous. And he asked, what is, what is software? And his answer was, software is something you didn't have time to put into hardware. And I thought that was actually really profound. And, and Apple has stuck with that mentality and tried to turn everything it can into hardware, which is why it makes such beautiful hardware products. And, and that's meant investing in its own chip design from the very early days. And so unlike most smartphones, Apple phones have chips inside that are largely designed by Apple. Uh, and that's made Apple one of the world's largest buyers of chips. 
around a quarter of TSMC's revenue comes from Apple in many years. And so Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, has as much influence over the semiconductor supply chain as almost anyone, um, because it's dollars from his iPhone orders uh, that are shaping how the industry is structured. And as I understand it, he came up through, so I mean, he used to do supply chain before he was the top dog. That's right. Final question is um, the way you've laid out the book is very pleasing. Not only is it, you know, stories, but the the chapters are, you know, they're they are not long winding roads. They are they are relatively short as these things go. They're they're grouped in, um, I guess it's set eight parts. Yeah, eight parts. Um, Describe the intention behind that. Um, and when did you do you always know you wanted to write it that way? Was that something that came to you? How did you design uh, the book itself? Well, I wanted to make the characters come through. And, and there were so many fascinating individuals, um, bombastic personalities, wild gamblers that uh, that I came upon as writing that I, I, I thought that shorter chapters would let me introduce more of these characters and, and have them uh, appear in more different places. And so one of the, the fun things of the book was that I, you know, it, it was I spent a lot of time learning about the technology and thinking about business models, but also got to talk to a lot of these individuals and understand um, how they got involved, the, the struggles they faced, uh, the battles they fought. Uh, and that was really the fun part of writing was telling their stories. And it was the fun part of reading. Uh, Chris Miller, the book is Chip War. Um, thank you so much uh, for your time and for writing the book. Thank you for having me. That's it for this month's edition of GabFest Reads. Our producer is Shana Roth. Ben Richmond is Senior Director of Operations of Podcasts. Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio at Slate. We'll be back next month with another edition of GabFest Reads. Until then, all three of us will be back in your feed on Thursday with a new episode of the Slate Political GabFest. Fest.